From the 5th of June this year, after a bit of a COVID interlude, our Nuffield journey was lucky enough to begin again for six Australian farmers, an Irishman and a Zimbabwean. I am aware it sounds like the start of a bad joke, but it was the start of a story that made for some fantastic learning opportunities and experiences that we're all very appreciative of. This was made possible by a mountain of work by Nuffield Australia and our generous sponsors who have been kind enough to support us with our endeavours. Here today we have four of us that have the privilege to give you the brief overview of our travels. It started in Singapore, continued into France, the UK, Canada and the United States over a five week period. Our biggest challenge is to give you all an overview within 15 minutes of an experience that we could all talk about for days. Travelling in the group was Luke Cantrell behind me, an organic cherry grower from New South Wales. Mitch Anderson also behind me, broadacre farmer from Victoria. Richie Quigley as well, broadacre farmer and livestock in irrigation from New South Wales. Myself, Dustin Pascoe, um, crops and sheep from uh, northern Victoria. And the people who are unable to attend today is Nick Krebs from the Hewitt Cattle Company, who's just moved back into Queensland. Um, Billy Browning, an irrigation um, broadacre cropper um, from New South, who's just got married on the weekend and is on his honeymoon at the moment, the lucky bugger. Uh, we've got the most Australian sounding Irish dairy farmer you've ever heard, Bruce Thompson. <laughs> and, and then we've got Ranga Haruba as well, who's a cattle and a game reserve manager from uh, uh, Zimbabwe. He was only able to join us, unfortunately, for two weeks on our tour. Uh, he was able to join us for the UK and uh, Canada sections. Our first destination leaving Australia was Singapore. One of the visits was to the Pashir Pajang Wholesale Centre, one of the largest wholesale fruit and veg markets in Asia. We were shown around by one of the local market agents, uh, Brian Seat, who not only gave us an insight into the local market, but also into the mindset of food importers. We were informed that although more distribution is again taking place through Singapore due to post-COVID reduction direct flights to other countries, Malaysia is now becoming another central hub due to its central geographical proximity within Asia. One question to Brian was we asked his thoughts on a potential global food shortage with current supply chain and geopolitical issues. His response was that he does not foresee a food shortage but a money shortage. He explained that price was still the driving factor in Singaporean markets above all other factors as they can basically import from any country and his belief was that any problem could be solved by money. This importation is a necessity as Singapore is a country only having 5% of its 75,000 hectares available for agricultural production. This poses unique challenges feeding a population of nearly 6 million people. The Singapore government has realised that this is a key issue and has implemented four key strategy, strategies to protect their food security. Strategy one <clears throat> was to continue to import from multiple countries, Malaysia being a big import partner. Strategy two was to produce outside Singapore, utilising foreign land such as in Chile and China through Singaporean-based companies. Strategy three was a 30 by 30 campaign to build up their local agri-food industries capability to reduce 30% of their nutritional needs locally and sustainably by 2030. Singapore is doing a lot of work in research and innovation, particularly around urban and vertical farming solutions. The fourth strategy, which is not documented, is for Singapore to own some of the supply chain in produce and commodities that they trade large volumes in order to lock in supply if things go bad. These strategies are ambitious and I believe Australia is still in the key position to assist Singapore with its food requirements into the future. Next we went into France. After pulling the all-nighter on the plane, very long flight, we've got into the airport, we get these tiny little cars and the gear sticks on the wrong side, the steering wheels on the wrong side, we start driving through Paris and we've got no idea what the signs are saying. We're going, oh gee, we're in for a new experience here. Uh, we made our way down to the Lyor Valley. And we met our hosts for the week, Chloe and Frederick. Uh, they very uh, straight away introduced us into the local food and culture. Over the next few days, we were exposed to a wide range of experiences by our generous hosts. Some of the highlights included visiting an extremely proactive dairy farmer, uh, Credit Agricol, and many beautiful markets that we found farmers selling their fresh produce. Antoine Maurice, who you can see there, he was a very proactive sixth generation dairy farmer that we met. He, along with his family and husband, had fully integrated their 500 hectare dairy farm, capturing value all along the dairy process. 
They had barned cows that, fully, that was fully automated, including Victor, an automatic feeder that you can see there. The scraping of the pens was also automated and value added by pro processing that manure in through a biodigester. The energy from that biodigester was sold as green energy back into the grid for around double the price that he was buying the energy in for. The remaining waste from the biodigester was then spread back onto the paddocks retaining 80% of their nutrients uh, to produce feed for their barn system with lower input costs. On the other end of their system, they had value added to their milk by producing beautiful cheeses and yogurts on their on-site fromagerie that they'd built. The products were sold locally and into a school system for their school lunches, capturing maximum value from their businesses. Another highlight was Credit Agricole. Credit Agricole is the biggest agricultural lender in France, accommodating a massive 80% of agricultural loans. The board who we met with were farmers themselves and very open with their lending policy, land values and subsidies in the French agriculture. These included dollars per hectare payments for grain farmers, subsidies on interest, on, on interest rates and restrictions on production and size. We all came away with an altered view of subsidies. The value of these subsidies was evident in the markets and the produce we were exposed to. Much of the produce we saw was produced within 25 kilometres of each of the markets. The subsidies allowed the farmers to create a real connection with the products that they produced, as well as time to build relationships with their, their customers that bought from them. The relationship with the customer, as well as the extra education in their school systems, created great pride by the general population for their farmers. This was to an extent that none of us had seen before and was very refreshing. Uh, next destination was the United Kingdom. And the UK seems to be still finding its feet post-Brexit, with the country having to take all the food production legislation that was implemented while in the EU and repurpose it, as well as renegotiating a lot of supply contracts. From London, we drove south, visiting numerous organisations and facilities. Our visits ranged from independent science-based research organisations, such as the National Institute of Agricultural Botany, which was founded after World War I due to a population food shortage in 1919, to large intergenerational family estates, clay target shooting and trout fishing in Meon Springs, which also gave us a great example of business diversity by the repurposing of an old large piggery into, a, into one of the region's main self-storage facilities through the utilisation of old shipping containers as well as importing, <coughs> importation of Mongolian yurts which they placed around the, the farm for agritourism accommodation. At Cranfield University, we were treated to lectures from leading ag academics discussing regenerative agriculture, water conservation, soil erosion, post-harvest storage, as well as innovation in food packaging such as research into seaweed plastic as a replacement from current fossil fuel-based plastics. Uh, we visited one of the only commercial producers of chlorophyll in Europe and one of the few in the world where they grow their own pastures to then extract chlorophyll to then be used in a range of value-add products from colouring the green arrow chocolate bars to nutraceuticals. A carbon initiative that raised our eyebrows was the burning of locally sourced wood to power electrical generation. They received healthy grants and good returns on exported electricity through this carbon initiative. We conclude our UK tour with a tour of Rathini Estate, an award-winning winery producing some of the highest quality English sparkling wine. This winery was started from scratch with a 35 million pound budget and the growing, led by our tour guide, vineyard manager and ex-2017 Nuffield scholar, Cameron Roucher. The UK currently appears to be decreasing their agricultural production for more regenerative and sustainable applications. It'll be very interesting to see how this plays out in the future. Canada was a highly anticipated destination for our next stop. Apart from a fairly brisk welcoming temperature of seven degrees, it did not disappoint. With two legendary tour guides, Steve LaRock and Harold Perry, both previous Nuffield scholars themselves, they are a prime example of what a Nuffield scholar could, should be. In southern Alberta, we visited a thriving Hutterite community, farm-owned brewery, a bison farm, greenhouses growing strawberries and tomatoes, supermarkets focused on locally source produce for higher-end consumers and vegetable farms. Cattle breeding and feedlots as well as dam and water catchments authorities and biodigesters. The standout link to most of these businesses were the fact that they too were facing similar challenges that we face in Australia. There was supply chain, access to capital, social licence, government regulation, staff constraints in most aspects. 
Yet there were some solutions there that were on display that did spark a lot of critical thinking, whether they were applicable or adaptable to the problems faced at home. Some of which were value adding, either through vertical integration or turning into a desirable product, bringing in partners to raise capital whilst using their expertise and yours to drive expansion and growth, the attraction of staff with an openness to show financial data and that progressing into a profit share model. From Canada, we found ourselves in the States in Washington, D.C., we were given access to both government and private enterprises. The foreign ag service provided us with an insight into local and global markets, as well as touching on the subsidy scheme and how it progressed to where it is today. We were also given access to Bayer for a no holes barred Q&A session where we could dig deeper into some pressing issues and views on what's next from a couple of senior figures. A standout experience from the tour was Capitol Hill building where we were able to get a tour from a local security guard. Oops. We won't go there. <laughs> um, just demonstrating what doors Nuffield can open to you, all you have to do is ask. I was a final destination on our journey where we found ourselves in the heartland of corn and beans. We were given insight into conservation agriculture, specifically around water quality, a large co-op, feedlots, organic grain and livestock, corn and soybean producers and another malt house. The common theme of challenges didn't change here, though they were facing one challenge more location relevant. The water quality is now a major focus after the drinking water in Des Moines was deemed compromised due to the nitrates finding its way into the river system. This occurred through overland flows and tile drainage, funneling excess nitrate and sediment into catchment areas with widespread cultivation still being used, not helping the situation. The key stakeholders in the farmers, government, and the co-op are coming together to implement practices to, to bring solutions such as minimum till, tile drainage incorporating saturated buffer zones and bioreactors, as well as cover cropping. We were able to be at the launch of a, a joint partnership between both private and government sectors resulting in the conversion of a Hagee sprayer into an intero sowing unit to plant cover crop whilst the corn is still growing to minimise bare earth time. At Heartland we will give an insight into how the cooperative structure works in their case handling everything from the planning stages to crop inputs, storage, transport and sales. They are responsible for 400,000 tonne of sales and movements per month into either export or domestic markets, one of which was Palmer County in Texas, with an annual consumption of 840,000 tonne of corn just for cattle feedlots. Heartland had 6,088 farmers in the co-op with an annual sales of $1.25 billion and was quite an opening coming in at the fifth largest ag retailer in the US. Uh, while it's hard to name just a few learnings from five weeks abroad with seven great mates, I'll try my best. Firstly, we learnt that American trucks are way better than the Australian Toyotas that we drive, and even better, the French farmers drive convertibles to work. An overarching, as an overarching statement, we learned that the good operators had great attention to detail, a positive can-do attitude, a passion for people and a passion for what they did and what they produced. I'll now break down into some more specific regions. We learned that in England they were pulling agricultural land out of production to meet government commitments to global emission requirements. <coughs> Excuse me. The countryside stewardship subsidy scheme is set up in a way that you can earn more by having permanent pastures sequestering carbon than you can growing cash crops to feed the nation. This was uh, 550 British pounds per hectare per year or the equivalent of 930 Australian dollars annually. This was all due to government policy and highlighted the group, to the group that there was a real risk of food shortage in Europe and the, it, of a food shortage in Europe in the future. The most common surprise, this is most common surprising, sorry, this is most surprising considering the current climate of the war between Russia and Ukraine but what we heard from Cheryl this morning is that we may have more of this to expect in the future. Also in Europe, farmers really valued their work-life balance. The majority of the farms we visited were not overly interested in expansion or growing, but were much more interested in producing the highest quality produce they could and spending time with their families while earning a modest wage. It also surprised the group how many organic farm farms we saw across the UK, with 30 to 40% of all the farms we visited being organic. They had moved this way to reduce costs of inputs while still yielding 70% of their conventional counterparts. 
we saw a lot of farms globally that were value adding to their produce. And the key to value adding was their marketing. The most successful of these businesses all had strong focus on marketing, growing their sales and creating demand for their produce. Nearly all of them were using social media as a tool to do this. <clears throat> Something that surprised me was, was that everywhere we went in the world, everywhere had their own challenges. Farming wasn't easy anywhere. Coming from southwestern Australia, naturally I thought where it rains, farming must be easy. We saw too wet, too dry, long days, short days, tornadoes, derechos, insects, just to name a few. And to take Iowa for an example, over 36 inches of rain for the year. They're the United States' largest grower of corn and their biggest export annually was topsoil into the Gulf of Mexico. They've lost two to four feet of topsoil in the last 200 years and 95% of the crop grown with conventional tillage. The high rainfall areas cover crop, in the high rainfall areas, cover crops were not grown for moisture retention but actually to store nutrients in organic matter and then cycle them back into the soil slowly to prevent nutrient runoff and soil erosion into waterways. Biodigesters producing green energy from the burning of methane were only viable where the government was subsidising the electricity generated from them. We saw examples of both very economical and very poor performing plants depending on government policy. Staff shortages were very common across the world. We learnt that employees valued a work-life balance nearly above all else. We learnt that land prices in Australia were somewhat cheaper than similar productive land overseas. And we also learnt that the world is ruled by those who turn up. You want a seat at the table, you don't want to be what's being served for dinner. We don't want Australia to end up with regulations similar to what we saw around the world, so to be sure to be on your local communities and boards to help steer the ship of Australian agriculture. In summary, it made me very thankful to be farming in Australia. A massive thank you must go to all of our investors and Nuffield Australia for the opportunity to have travelled the world looking at agriculture. Thank you.